founder and organizer of Entrepreneurial Appetite, a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism, and supporting Black businesses. And when I think about Black businesses, um, I think about that broadly in terms of Black institutions, um, So, which is why we are partnering with SACAM uh, to bring you a conversation <laughs> with Dr. Leonard Moore, my mentor, one of my mentors, um, who I'm going to bring up now. And I, I, I want to, I, when I talk about Dr. Moore, I'm not going to give you the long name of his title that goes along with his position as a university professor at UT Austin, because that, that's not what makes Dr. Mm -hmm. Moore special mm -hmm. to me or the, the brothers and sisters that he has mentored in his over 20 years mm -hmm. of being a college professor. Dr. Moore is special because he operates in a constellation of other mentors that help Black students get through their undergraduate, their master's, mm -hmm. and their PhDs. And while, thank you. thank you. And while he is very charismatic, uh, very engaging, what the public might see is him, but the people that he interacts with, they see all the other people that get to pour into them as well. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting about our relationship is that my mentor, Dr. Lewis Harrison, was his mentor. Mm -hmm. And I got shared with him because of the great relationship that they had. And it's just a testament to see how brothers moving and navigating through predominantly white institutions of higher education and not letting their egos get involved. Although what you might see on the surface is ego, mm -hmm. it, it's not. It's really love, it's care. And what also makes it special and is related to our topic of discussion today is that his love and his care is not limited to black folk, but he understands the necessity of working with those who are in front of him, which is why we're having a conversation today about teaching black history to white people. Thank you. Thank you, man. All right. Thanks, man. So um, Thank you. <clears throat> before, before we start, I just want to check and make sure. Um, does the Zoom sound better? OK, mm -hmm. all right. Um, so Dr. Moore, just yep. tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, a little bit about your history with Black education, mm -hmm. excuse me, with Black history. Mm -hmm. Because as much as this book is about strategies in history, of uh, black black history, it's your personal story with black history as well. Yeah. So just just tell us a little bit about that. So I'm from the greatest city in the world, Cleveland, Ohio. Don't laugh. You know we joke it. It's a, people say it's a great place to be from, but not at. All right. Uh, and I went to Jackson State University, and I tell people I, I, when I finished high school, I had a 1.6 grade point average, and I got a 15 on the ACT. All right. Uh, I didn't think I was dumb. I just wasn't really engaged in the process of learning. Uh, Dad went to Case Western Reserve University, finished in 1955. Uh, Mom was from the rural south. She didn't have a college degree. So there was an expectation we'd go to college. So my dad sent me to Jackson State. And after my third semester, I had a 1.8. And so when people asked my dad, how's Leonard doing in college? He said, well, he's actually doing better in college than he's doing in high school, all right? So for me, the transformation came, and I'm very transparent. Um, my... Second semester of my sophomore year, I showed up to, to my history class. I didn't think I was drunk. I knew I'd been drinking. I didn't think I was drunk, though. Y'all can laugh at that. Come on, y'all, all right? And the professor pulled me to the side, Dr. Davis, and he said, man, you need to go back to Cleveland and quit wasting your parents' money. And it was a life-changing conversation. So I think I finished my last five semesters at Jackson State with about a 3.6. And when I tell people that they prepared me to breeze through a PhD program at Ohio State, they did it. So I got a PhD at Ohio State at 26. But the funny thing is, when you tell black people that you're a history major, they say, what you gonna do with that? And so my friends would laugh at me, my family would laugh at me. They say, oh, he think he gonna be Malcolm X or W.B. Du Bois, you know? But I tell you, the only, the only thing I've ever done for a living for the last 25, the last 28 years, PhD program at Ohio State, been a professor 24 years, is teach black history. And I, I, I've been blessed to be able to do it. You know, I, I, told, I told, think I told you, uh, Bonnie, I've been teaching a black history class with a hundred white judges for the last three weeks on Zoom. 
Now, these ain't white liberal judges. These are white judges from the Panhandle, Amarillo, West Texas, East Texas. And so that's what I, I'm just blessed to be able to do stuff like that. Yeah. So we all know what happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. We got COVID-19, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd. Can you tell us what, what was your motivation for writing the book and some of the things that you did in the position that you were in at UT Austin mm -hmm. to bring these conversations about Black history mm -hmm. in the context of what we're seeing right now in the racial climate? Well, I knew when the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor stuff jumped off, I knew it, at the time I was vice president for diversity at, at Texas and this should be in a professor. And there was no response in the university. They didn't know what to do. And so, you know, I, I gave a little uh, workshop on Zoom. I thought a hundred people would come. We had 4,000 faculty and staff. Everybody was at home, right? And, and 4,000 faculty and staff showed up and I was trying to explain to them the reason for black frustration. This is why black folk are frustrated and, 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 and angry. And so out of that, I had this crazy idea. I said, well, I'm gonna teach a black history class. And we're gonna see who shows up. So we had about 1600 people every week, you know, primarily white faculty and staff at UT showed up and we think it was very transformational. So the book is an outgrowth of those lectures I did that summer. Yeah. Can you, I, I wanna hear a, a little bit more about your pedagogy th throughout your career. Cause mm -hmm. y'all don't know this, okay? When I was a graduate student at UT Austin, when I got there, everybody was like, you need to go watch Dr. Moore's Black Power <laughs> class. And I, I don't know what college was like for y'all and the audience that went to school, but like no one volunteered <laughs> to go to somebody else's class that was a lecture. No, nobody did. But, and I'm just gonna tell y'all, all around class, you had Asian students, you had white students, you had black students, PhD students, master students, <laughs> engineering students, <laughs> physical education majors, physics majors, the whole nine shows up to the class. And this auditorium seats about 500 people. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I'm surprised, you know, the fire chief didn't come in <laughs> and shut it down because there's students mm -hmm. sitting in, in, in the rows, mm -hmm. right? In the steps that lead up to the top of the class. So talk about how you're able to engage black students, mm -hmm. white students, but really just a large just swath of people in the university yeah. to come and listen to you talk about black history, in particular, mm -hmm. the black power movement where some people might get a little, right. you know, a little afraid of. Right. I'll say first off, man, just as a spiritual level, I, I really believe that I am doing what God has called me to do. And I believe somebody said, when you are anointed to do something, it just comes easy to you. You know, so for me, other people think it's a big deal, but I'm just, I, I walk in with enthusiasm. It, in my mind, it should be a sin for a teacher to come in there and be boring. I'm just honest, it, it, it should be a sin. And I tell some of my colleagues, go watch yourself lecture and tell me you get bored listening to yourself. And so for me is that I know I have 500 students from all backgrounds. One thing about UT now with the auto admit role, we got students from every county across the state. So you got every demographic in there. And in many ways, my class is a cross section of, I would say America, you know what I mean? And I understand that most people, even if they don't like black folks, they interested in us. Yeah. Right? You know, they're interested in black folk, right? And so for me, man, it's just always hitting the, with, hitting the door with excitement. You know, I always ask very provocative questions at the beginning of class, you know, so I hit them with one a few weeks ago. I said, so if black folk in the state of Texas couldn't vote from roughly 1890 to about 1967, 68, how do we address that discrepancy? And I'd be like, maybe we need to do hashtag 2090 where white folk can't vote for 70 years. <laughs> no, you have to do it. You gotta get them thinking. And so it shouldn't be boring. So, you know, I, my wife will tell you on days that I teach, man, I'm up pacing the house at 6 a.m. Because I'm excited because it's a privilege. And those, and I believe in reverse mentoring. And those 500 students I teach, they've helped me become a better husband, a better father, a better person. You know, and some of my colleagues shouldn't be in front of anybody teaching. They need to go to a research institute. That's true. That's true. Yeah, I, huh? I, I, I would agree with that. Right. So I'm going to ask this question. Yep. I want to talk about this, this reverse mentoring. Mm -hmm. um, 
Get, give me an example of what it's like for you to be reverse mentor by a black student. And then I want you to give me an example of how you've been reverse mentored by a white student. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Um, let me do it the first one first. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's stuff like, so I got a lot of feminists in my class and I, and I provoke them all the time. I'd be like, if I said, how many of y'all agree in toxic masculinity? They all raise their hand. So I say, if there's a toxic masculinity, there must be a toxic femininity. Look, some of y'all getting upset that I'm even mentioning that, all right? But my point, but here's, here's my point. When Google, has, when Google has all the content, the role of the professor is to be provocative, to encourage, to motivate, and not allow students to be intellectually lazy. And so the verse, verse minute, I remember we were talking about, I got two daughters, my, Jacques can raise your hand right there. She's at Incarnate Word and they play Rice tomorrow. She's probably thinking about that game tomorrow, but she'll be all right. But I remember talking about, telling my kids about raise, talking to students about raising kids. And they said, Dr. Moore, whatever you do, don't have a, one set of rules for your daughters and another set of rules for your son. And then they began to talk about how they were raised. So that, that's some of the reverse mentoring. Now from white, I don't know if I've been reverse mentored by white students, but what I, do, what I, did, what I used to do till he died, I listened to Rush Limbaugh every day. Y'all like, this Negro is crazy, no? And what I appreciated about Russ, she was an entertainer. That's what he was, for, for me. but I understood that he was speaking for a lot of white folk who felt they didn't have a voice. And what I did by listening to Rush and then by listening to some of my students in class, I, I began to appreciate their perspective, although I disagreed with it. So when January 6th jumped off, I knew that had been building since 9-11. Yeah. Why 9-11? Make, make that connect, because 9-11 happened 20, that's years, 20 ago. years ago. You got about six events. You got 9-11, then after that, that statistic that came out that said the US will be majority minority by 2030. Then after that, you had the housing crisis. Then after that, you had the recession. And then after that, you had the election of Barack Hussein Obama. So you had all this stuff Obama. building up yeah. that sort of explained this white working class with frustration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. The, the reason why I brought up you being reverse mentored by white students is because there, there, are two, there are two white students in the book that stand out to me mm -hmm. that in some ways I think you had an interesting relationship with. Mm -hmm. The one is when you were teaching a class or a TA at Ohio State. Oh man, that was wow. And the other one was the young lady mm -hmm. who took the content from your class and was sharing it with her mother. Yeah, yeah. So if you could talk about yeah. the relationship that you had with those two students, it would be enlightening. So when I was a grad student at Ohio State, when, once you get so far in your program, they give you your own class to teach. And I was excited. I taught it like on a Monday night. Now, this is winter quarter, January through March. First day of class, now it's about 20 degrees outside. White kid walks in with a, like a muscle shirt on and like a, a vest. And he had a big old Confederate flag on his arm. All right, this guy sat in the front row every class for 10 straight weeks. I don't know if he's trying to intimidate me. At the end of the semester, the, the white brother had tears in his eyes. And he said, man, I never knew this about the black experience, man. You know, he said, I want to apologize for coming in here every day and having my tattoo visible. So that's one. The second story is a white girl. She said, Dr. Moore, you know, my mom, you know, didn't want me to take your class. I said, why not? She said, well, she said that you were going to turn me into a liberal. All right. All right. <laughs> And she said, but I convinced her to, to let me take it. I said, well, what made her change her mind? She said, well, I could take the class on one condition. I had to send my mom the syllabus. She bought all the books. And after every lecture on Tuesday and Thursday, I had to email her the class notes. And every Tuesday and Thursday night, me and my mom would discuss the course material for an hour. Here's how God works. End of the semester, I get an email from this mom. She said, Dr. Moore, you don't know me, but I did not want my daughter to take your class. She listed the reasons why she said, but I let her take it and I've been reading the books. She said, this class has not only transformed me, but it has changed my whole family's outlook because we were never exposed to any aspect of black history. And this just explains so many things to us. And so those are stories that, that, that I found to be very, very, uh, I mean, that's why I teach, man. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They'll be very impactful and you know, things that just move the needle. Mm -hmm. So I have a neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, Brandon, who is 
who's running the Zoom right now, a good friend of mine, also a mentee of yours, has been at my house, had dinner with my wife and I. And he can tell you that when he drives down the street, one of the ways we drive down the street, I have a neighbor, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating, mm -hmm. he's got 20 flags <laughs> in his front lawn. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what half of them mean. Okay. He's got a come and take it flag. He's got Confederate flags. <laughs> he's got one flag with a snake going around a pole. He's got another right. flag that looks, I, I don't know what all the flags mean, mm -hmm. but it ain't good to me. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Taking some of the, the practical things that you've done, because you, mm -hmm. you teach in big lecture halls, you have a stage, there's some power that comes with mm -hmm. being a professor, whether you're tenured or not. Mm -hmm. Like, how do, we, how do I have a conversation about black history with my neighbor down the street that's just extra? Let me tell you what me and my wife did. We live in a, we live in a cul-de-sac and it was uh, seven houses in the cul-de-sac. It was one African-American family, us. It was a Latino family next to us, but the dad, the husband wanted to be white. So that's different. Uh, Y'all can laugh at that. That's okay. <laughs> and it was uh, for the five or four, five white families. And so after the Trump elections, I remember, I thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. You know, I don't know when I, I, that's what I thought when I went to sleep. I started hearing like in the middle of the night, I said, wife says, is it thunder? Is it thundering out there? No fireworks going off in our neighborhood when they announced Trump won, all right? So anyway, I said, my wife said, Tyce, why don't we just invite our neighbors over and just ask them, all right? And I said, you know, I invited them over and they probably like, man, this dude is crazy. And I said, you know, we got a good call to set, we look out for everybody. I'm just trying to figure out why y'all voted for Trump. I didn't ask them if they voted, I just assumed they did. But here's what was, what, was, what, was, what was revealing to me. They all had legitimate reasons for voting for Trump. One person said, well, Leonard, I think he'll represent Christian principles. Another person said, well, Leonard, uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I think he'll, 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 he'll look out for business owners. Another person said, well, Leonard, you know, I told you before, my boss, he worked at Merck. He said, my boss told me, well, quote, since you aren't white, gay, or a woman, you'll never get promoted again. And he said, that's why I voted for Trump, because I don't like reverse racism. So they all had legitimate reasons for voting for Trump. So I would just say, man, let's, let's go have a conversation with him. Yeah. I, but you... <laughs> So this, this makes yeah. me think about another part in the book mm -hmm. where you talk about the White Citizens Council. Mm -hmm. So my neighbor, I view my neighbor like a Klansman. Mm -hmm. Why? It's, it's, I, I have Let to me tell you what I, so at my kid, at my the middle school, my, my daughter, my kids went to, they had had that, uh, there was a white sheriff who was always there, all yeah. right, school resource officer. And I was doing a, 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 a workshop or a lecture at the school and he came to me, he said, well, Leonard, man, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, he I heard you talking about the Confederate flag. He said, Leonard, I didn't, I don't think anything is wrong with it. You know, I have one in my front yard. <laughs> okay. And then I said, no, man, that's problematic. And so I saw him a couple weeks later. He said, Leonard, you know, I want you to let you know that I took the flag down. Now I wanted to ask him, did you put it back up in the living room or, or what did you do with it? All right. But in his mind, in his mind, he didn't think there were any racist connotations at all with the Confederate flag. So I think sometimes we assume people know, but sometimes they just don't. I, I, I'll give you that. <laughs> but let me tell you some more about these flags, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There was one flag, there was one flag mm -hmm. with Trump's head on it, mm -hmm. on Rambo's body, yeah. big biceps and a, and a bazooka. Mm -hmm. There's another flag, F Biden, not my president. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, like, it's like really extra. Why don't you invite, invite him over for dinner and just spark up a conversation? Um, I gotta ask my wife first. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I, I gotta ask. I gotta ask my wife first. Yeah. Because I, I, I gotta make sure she's okay with that. Um, but I, I want, let, let me say this, Lance. Okay. Most I was talking to a white pastor in Dallas. He said, "Leonard, man, we just don't see all this racism black people talk about." I say, "You wouldn't see it because because where you're sitting, it doesn't allow you to see it." But what he said, he said, "Leonard, I'm an old white guy. I just assume." that after the civil, all the civil rights legislation was passed, that everything was good. So in his mind, when there are no visible barriers in his mind, he's like, no, it's equal opportunity. And one thing I do, I talk about in the book in my class, any, any, any good Monopoly players in here, like real good Monopoly players? Like if we could play for some real money, you'd be down, you'd be in. And so here is the Monopoly example I give. So let's say we all sit down, me and six of my white friends sit down and play Monopoly. They get 1500 bucks to start off with, I get 750. We pick our part, uh, the, the shoe, 
the horse, the thimble, the iron, whatever, the dog, right? And as we're about to play, they say, well, Leonard, we got some special rules for you. Leonard, you can't buy any property until you roll for the 20th time. So I'm educated. I'm like, okay, I, I know how to overcome. I, I, you know, I can overcome very. So I'm playing the game where they say, Leonard, now you can go around the board, you can pay rent and you can pay taxes. And of course, since you're black, you can go to jail, but you can't buy any property. I'm going somewhere with this. So now when it's my time, now when I'm eligible to buy property on the 20th roll, all the property gone. I don't have no money. I don't have no property, but I've been sitting playing in the game. And then a neighbor comes by and they observe us playing. They're like, Leonard, how come you ain't got no money or property? And before I could say anything, they said, you're lazy. You want a government handout. It's like, no, they didn't allow me to play. Part two. So let's say two hours into the game, all of us get up and our children come take our place at the table. And we pass down our property and our money to our kids. My daughter Jocelyn's sitting there with no money and no property. Everybody else's kids got money and property. And they say, Jocelyn, where your money at? She say, y'all discriminated against my parents. And they say, you can't blame us. That happened a long time ago. And so we don't talk about the Jim Crow period nearly enough. I ain't gotta go to slavery. Jim Crow was state sanctioned racism and discrimination where black people were paying taxes to institutions they had no access to. And we don't talk about that nearly enough. That brings me to something you said at the very beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And the question I wanna ask is, why teach black history to white people what you answer and you talk about how maybe it is crucial for us to getting the reparations mm -hmm. that we deserve. Like, how do, how do you see that playing out? Because I, I don't know. I don't know about reparations. I, I don't know. I, I mean, you can make the case for it. I don't know. Yeah. But, uh, but to me, it's, it's, you know, when I got into teaching black history, I thought I'd just teach black students. That's it. You know, that's when I wrote my cover letter to that job at LSU, I said, I want to teach African American history and I want to immerse myself into the lives of black students. So at LSU for the first couple of years, the class was 70, 80% black. Over time, it became like 50, 50. And, and, and let me tell you how white supremacy works. I remember my first year there, I had a whole bunch of black students in my classes and I went to the football facility and I said, I need you to put all them brothers in my classes. Well, what do you mean? I said, y'all make their schedules out, put all the brothers in my classes. Do you know a black professor came by my office and he said, Leonard, I, I see what you're trying to do, man. Listen to this. He said, but I wouldn't have all them black students in my class. And I definitely wouldn't have those football players in my class. I said, why not? He said, because then people won't think your class is intellectually rigorous. I said, so you want me to discriminate against black students? And I said, if somebody doesn't think my class is intellectually rigorous, it doesn't matter who's in the class. But that's the kind of nonsense we would deal with because in this professor's eyes, the more white students in the class, come on somebody, made it much more, what, intellectually, I don't know, what's what I'm looking for? Rigorous. Rigorous or credible. Stimulating. Cre yeah, yeah, stimulating or something like that. And so, and so at Texas, you know, over time, the class has become majority white. And these are white kids from Alamo Heights, Westlake, I you know Westlake and Austin, I call that the Norway of Texas, all right? It's literally the whitest place in the world, all right? Uh, um, and, and it's funny, so, Highland Park in Dallas, River Oak. I teach all these elite white kids. And here's what people don't realize. The most woke people on the campus, it ain't the black kids from Houston and Dallas. It ain't the Mexican kids from the Valley. It's those rich white wealthy kids. Super woke, because they got money, they got social capital, and they know whatever they do, they won't be disciplined or punished for it. So the eyes of Texas stuff, of course, black students were vocal, but it was those wealthy white students who were pushing back against some of that stuff. So how does that, how, what happens when woke goes wrong? Woke goes wrong all the time. Cause you, you give an example in a book, I think mm -hmm. about the law professor oh, yeah. and you having yeah. to mediate. Yeah. So how do you teach when it's well-meaning, mm -hmm. but 
is woke going wrong. So I have a partner about white liberals and he talks about woke going wrong. So there was a law professor at a certain university, I won't mention it, but you can figure it out, all right? <laughs> you can figure it out easily. So this law professor, anybody go to law school? So how, how does law school, you get one exam at the end of the semester? A couple of questions. So he was teaching a constitutional law class and the question he asked, I thought it was a brilliant question. He said, if you, he said, defend school segregation from a legal perspective. So basically take that 1954 Brown decision and basically you be the defense attorney and you, you defend it. I thought it was a brilliant question. The students were <laughs> enraged. They wanted the professor, they couldn't fire him. They said that this professor should not be allowed to make out his own exam. Black professor should not be allowed to make out his own exams anymore. They said he needs to have somebody supervise his classroom because students said they were triggered what are the words they use? They were triggered and they were traumatized. I said, by a question? And so the law school dean asked me to come mediate this dispute. And so when I got out of the car and walked in the building, I said, it'd probably be a group of about 15 people, one black person. And when I walked in, guess what I saw? A group of 12 students, one black. The ringleader was a middle-aged white guy, 33, who looked to be visibly upset at the question. And so I asked the law professor and the dean to leave. And I said, let me ask y'all a question. I said, y'all, this really upset y'all, huh? They said, yes. I said, how many students started, how many, what was the size of the entering class to this law school this year? They said, 350. I said, how many of those students were black? I said, it's 12. So you all getting more upset over a question than you are about getting more blacks in the law school. And so we call that performative justice because in many ways it's just justice for show. And so I told him, if you know, next time you want to advocate on behalf of black folk, why don't you ask them first? A simple question, what can I help you fight for? And it wouldn't be over this law question. It would be over something much more substantive and something much more meaningful. So that's when wokeness goes wrong. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a part in the book where you, you give suggestions mm -hmm. For white liberals can, can you just give us i'm gonna give yes an overview of some yeah. of those so number one you got to see race oh dr Moore, i don't see, i need you to see race when i have 40 undocumented students in my class their experience at the university is like un, in no other when they get a text message man is somebody getting deported when somebody walks in the classroom in the middle of a lecture are they coming to take me away so I have to see them for who they are. The 10 Muslim women who wear hijabs, I got to see them. So for me, not to, for me to say I don't see race is a cop out. And what I tell people, it's not about treating everybody the same. It's about treating people fairly. So to say you don't see race is a cop out. You got to see it. The six, seven brother on the basketball team who walks around with headphones on all day with a hoodie on because he feels intimidated in the classroom, I got to see him and I got to understand his experience. And so number one is see race. Let me get the rest of them. Okay. Number two is be open and honest about your biases and your stereotypes. Do you know I was at a faculty center? I've been a professor for 24 years. At least that's what they told me. Shaka Smart, the basketball coach, was at a faculty senate meeting a uh, former basketball coach, and he was talking about what he does with his young men during the summer to prepare them for life after basketball. There are two black faculty in the room, me and my boy, about 100 faculty members. When the meeting is over, I overhear one of my white colleagues say, ask him, he's an assistant basketball coach, point at me. Now here I am, an endowed professor, but in that, in, but, but, they, people always want to associate me with the athletic role. I got a nine-year-old white kid who lives next door to me, all right? He came out one day, he said, Mr. Moore, what do you coach again at UT? <laughs> but, but so you got you to gotta be open and honest with your biases are. You, we all got to. We all got them. I like to tell a story. I had to deal with mine. I had a white girl. She came to my office about 10 years ago, and if you looked up white sorority girl in the dictionary, it was her. And the minute I saw her, I made several assumptions. She from Houston, her parents got money, she's in a wealthy sorority, she probably goes tanning often. Guess what? She lived in a battered 
women, her and her mom lived in a battered women's shelter for three years in high school. She said the first time she's had her own room in her life was when she came to UT in the dorm. So I had all these assumptions about her simply by looking at her. And she said, Dr. Moore, I don't like those sorority girls. And even if I did, I couldn't afford it. And so we gotta be open and honest with our bias. I do, when I, when I work with executives, I do an assignment. I pass out four identical resumes, four identical. And the only thing that's different on them is the name. I got a Muslim woman on there, a Chinese woman, a black woman, and a Latino woman. And I say, I could, if I had some eye tracking software, I could tell what your biases are by following your eyes to see what section of the resume your eyes go to first. And so we just gotta be open about our biases and stereotypes. Now the microaggression stuff, do you know what it's like to show up at a dinner at the University of Texas, a Christmas dinner that the president is sponsoring and they give you the, and they give you the name of the other black person who's six, seven? I'm like, no, I'm not Dr. Smith, I'm Leonard Moore. They gave him Leonard Moore's name tag, the dean of the graduate school. But, but, it, but, it, but it's constant, but we, I don't get upset about it because it's just what we do. And, and I would say the biggest thing is, you know, if you're gonna be an ally, ask people how you can help them. That's the biggest thing, ask folk how you can help them and don't assume that you know. So I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about because, because we're here in San Antonio, mm -hmm. there was recently, I think, a meeting of, of leaders in different industries and a commitment to racial justice. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I notice here sometimes is that those leaders who work in mainstream organizations and institutions or in government go to the same Black leaders mm -hmm. who aren't necessarily representative of the younger generation mm -hmm. or who, from my perspective, I sometimes, I haven't seen build anything for black people where I am. And I think this is part of the frustration mm -hmm. that people who are millennials and younger have. Yeah. So what advice do you give to people who work in the mainstream, in the institutions that have the power mm -hmm. and the money for thinking more broadly about the black leaders mm -hmm. that they interact with? What are you really asking? <laughs> Like if you want me to keep it real, yes. Um, and I think I I speak in some ways for a lot of younger black folk here mm -hmm. in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I feel like there hasn't been much built here for black folk, and I don't. I, so don't, are you saying established black leaders are basically gatekeepers? You you could say that, but but I, I but I don't I don't know if I want to say that. I I, I think that. I think that there are highly educated, mm -hmm. talented, smart, savvy, mm -hmm. young folk who are out here doing great things, but we are not seen mm -hmm. by the establishment in these cities that we're going to and becoming these thriving professionals, these emergent mm -hmm. professionals, you know? Yeah. And I'm not blaming the older black folk. Yes, you are, but it's okay. In some ways, yeah, I mean, I mean, if I'm I, being honest, but, but it's also the, the, the people with the power and yeah. in institutions, right? They, it's like they're blind. Well, I think, man, we fought so much to have a seat at the table, but what do you do when you have a seat at the table? And too many people love access. You know, they love, people will meet with you all day, all night, but if you aren't demanding anything, then you're wasting people's time. And I, I told my students this today, I said, you know, the black elite, we, we fail to realize that much of what we have access to was because of radical black people. Radical, super ra people radical. And, and we look down upon those people that it don't take all that. Hell, it does take all that. It does take all that, you know? And I talk about the Black Panthers, in many ways, they were the shock troops for black America. And I remember Martin would tell people, you can either deal with me or you can deal with Brother Malcolm and them. Who are you going to deal with? And so there's always been a thing of people working together where you got more of a radical element, right? But what I feel now is that the radical element is often excluded because we don't like the way that looks. 1957 was the first year the University of Texas admitted Black people, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. If Heman Sweat said, well, you know what, I'll just go to law school at Michigan or Ohio State or UCLA, they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't let black folk in. But that's also the same year, coincidentally, where the University of Texas 
started mandating standardized tests for the first time in its history. Coincidence, right? So we've got to get back to this protest radical stuff. And I know some of us may not like it. Check this out. If you look at corporate America, when they, there have been three waves of corporate America opening doors for black folks and all happened after three tra tragic incidents. April 4th, 1968, aftermath of the King assassination, corporate America says we got to do something, a ton of initiatives. Rodney King beating second wave. And guess what the third wave was last summer? So typically there has to be some kind of trauma, right? For corporate America to say, we got to do better. Last question before we go to the audience. Mm -hmm. What should be the role of the chief diversity officer? Well, right before the pandemic, I was up in New York City speaking to a group of bankers. And it's amazing the groups of people I talk to. I mean, those judges, bankers, realtors, uh, you know, and I told them, I said, how many of you all have a real black person as a part of your leadership team? They looked at me, they paused. And I said, no, a real black person. And I said, probably none of you, I said, you probably have a chief diversity officer. And if they are black, you probably put them in there because they were safe and they wouldn't challenge you. I said, but here's the problem with that. When, when your organization confronts a racial crisis, that person, A, ain't qualified to handle it. They don't have no credibility and you haven't empowered them to do anything. So now a crisis hits your organization, you know that that person don't know nothing. So what you do, you get on the phone and you call up your white peers who don't know nothing. And the issue continues to blow up because you don't have the expertise in house to handle it. And I said, in this climate, your chief diversity officer should be your most important hire. But it gotta be somebody authentic and somebody who will tell you what you don't wanna hear, but what you need to hear. But what I am seeing across the country are people with no expertise, people who do not know how to move the needle and people who are simply excited to have a title. These folks don't even have budgets. I asked, I said, man, can you even buy pizza for the King holiday? <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, I wanna welcome the audience to ask questions. I'm gonna tell you how we're gonna do this because I want the people in, in the Zoom to be able to participate and I want them to be able to hear, okay? So uh, Brandon, who is man in the Zoom, when questions come in the chat, you will relay them to us. Dr. Moore, what we'll do is we'll repeat the question okay. so that everyone can hear it and then we'll answer the questions. And the same cool. thing for the audience. So if you're in the audience and you have a question, you raise your hand, you'll say it. We'll repeat the question so the people in the Zoom can hear it and then we'll go from there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open it up to the people in the audience here live first to give people in the Zoom the opportunity to type their questions in, their questions in the chat and um, we'll do it that way. If you feel like you need the mic, uh, Deborah, do you think maybe we could appreciate you? <laughs> so if there's any questions in the audience, uh, just raise your hand and we'll get to you. Everybody quiet. <laughs> so my question for you, is at what point did you realize you had the balls to have this conversation, mm -hmm. not just in private settings, mm -hmm. but in public settings? You, you know what, man? I've, uh, I'm, just, I'm just cut this way. I remember when I first got to LSU, I mean, the brothers on the football team, they weren't graduating. It was a thugged out culture. Uh, and I remember telling the president and the athletic director, man, you're running a plantation around here. No, oh, I said, that's what you're doing. These brothers just making all this money. Nobody's graduating. And so for me, I'm just not cut to hold my tongue. And I've been called a lot of things in my life, divisive, uh, rabble rouser, loud, arrogant. Nobody has ever called me a liar. And I just, I was just raised to believe that the folks with the most got to use their voice. Because I, I understand every day when I used to drive to campus at LSU, that they excluded black people. And every day when I drive to the University of Texas, I tell myself, I am standing on the shoulders of other folks. 
Their struggle allows me to earn a generous salary, all of that stuff. So how could I get in the space and be quiet? And the other thing is, you can't miss something you never had. I had a discussion with somebody affiliated with the university and I think they were trying like to keep me quiet. And this person said, well, Dr. Moore, you know, you have a seat on this private jet whenever you want. That doesn't, I mean, that doesn't do nothing for me. And so for me, it's just my, see, here's, here, let me say it like this. My parents didn't get the memo. I wasn't raised with low self-esteem. I, was, I wasn't raised to believe that what black folk had was inferior or it was less than. I wasn't raised with that. And so I'm just being kind of true to myself. And I don't know why people call me radical. I don't think I'm radical. I think other people are just silent because they're afraid of losing something. But if you have access to places that regular black folk don't, you got to speak up. You, you, I mean, and for those of us who call ourselves believers, the word tells me that promotion comes not from the east or the west. Let me leave that alone. Y'all ain't ready for that. But, and so the question is, why have we been conditioned to be quiet? That's the question. Educated Black folks. And everybody has a role to play. Your role may not be to be vocal like mine, but if that ain't your role, be quiet. Don't go behind the scenes and cut me down. Can I, can I add to that? Because I think that there's, that there's something that you didn't mention that I talked about before in your mm -hmm. introduction. So Dr. Moore brought up that his role, he has a role in this, right? But my relationship with him is one that extends beyond him to a network of other brothers who helped me get through, right? So um, one person is confronting the president, the provost, the CEO, the COO, right? The, the whatever, but the other person is bringing brothers and sisters into the organization mm -hmm. so they can get the job at the Fortune 500 mm -hmm. company, so that they can get their PhDs mm -hmm. sitting on their dissertation committees. And I think part of it is also understanding like what your role Abs is, absolutely. right? Right. In, 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 the, in the wider frame of the struggle mm -hmm. where you are in particular. And people need to be called out. I was in Riverside, California, where all the black folk have moved to out of LA. And it was a councilman from Compton there. And he stood up and he said, we got to start calling people out. And what he said was, he said, we go to church with some of these folk. They in our same fraternity sorority. And what he said, he said, it's not a personal attack. He was saying like this, Langston, in your role, <laughs> you have failed us. You have sold us out and we are going to campaign against you. We still love you and you can still come to the cookout, but in this role, we ain't going to support you no more. And we don't do that nearly enough. You, you can separate the politician from, I would say, the person. So the question is, <laughs> how, does, how does he teach his white teacher? How does he convince his white teacher to teach about black history? Man, I just leave that alone. Sometimes it's better not to have it than to have it done wrong. Right. But let me say this, though. Now, now I will say this. I, I ain't talked to black parents for a minute. Sometimes these white teachers put, put forth a good faith effort. And sometimes it may come up short. But what we can't do is to go attack the teacher. Well, you made my child feel uncomfortable because when you do that, they're not doing nothing else. And so for those teachers who are making an effort to do it, we got to support them. I think, you know. You know, we did a lot of road trip. My wife's from Los Angeles. So we did a whole lot of road tripping, you know, driving from Louisiana to Cleveland, Louisiana to LA, so forth, Seattle and all that. And we made it a point to stop at every Black History Museum and every HBCU along the way, no matter where we went. That's what we did as a family. And, you know, and I think we got to get our kids to museums more. And so it may not be them necessarily sitting down reading Black History. There's a lot of multimedia stuff you can do. But I think we just got to we got to expose them to more stuff, and I think they'll. I mean, but I think it's something over time you develop an appreciation for. So two to three things for young black professors who work at predominantly white institutions. Suggestions. Number one, don't have your identity caught up in a title. Y'all got quiet on that, but that's that's serious. And number two, you got to continue to doing the things you did that made you 
have fun. For instance, when I was in grad school at Ohio State, I mentored at a black church, black boys for two and a half years. And if you got a 30 page paper to do, it may seem stressful, but when you leave that campus and go in the community and start pouring into those young people, the paper, it ain't stressful no more because they got real life issues. And so what typically happens with a lot of professors is the professor identity takes over and all you're doing is hanging out with other boring academics. I'm just being honest. And you stop doing the things that were fun. You stop going to church. You stop being active in your fraternity or sorority. And then you wonder why we have, you know, why black academics have all these issues of isolation because you've essentially separated yourself from the community. And so you don't separate yourself. And that's why I tell people, it may sound good to say you're a professor at Cornell or Dartmouth. Y'all ever been there before? The folks at Dartmouth, the sisters got to drive two and a half hours to Boston to get their hair done. And so often we're taking positions in places. So for us, I, I, I flew out to the University of Oregon for an interview about five years ago. And I'm like, they got all that Nike money. And I had it down. I was get that job. I was going to take that Nike money, put a community center up in LA, the Bay Area, New York. I had it all down. When I flew into Eugene, I looked down. I looked at the trees and could tell there were no black folks there. But here is why it hit me that that wasn't the place for me. And I think we got a professor here, right? So I'm in this interview, it was for a VP job there. And, and they said, what's your greatest accomplishment? You know, in Texas, I said, well, increasing, significantly increasing black male enrollment to, to lessen the gap between black men and black women and creating a black male PhD pipeline. You know, you know what the person's response was? That sounds very sexist and gendered to me. So I knew at a place like Oregon, diversity had nothing to do with black folks, nothing whatsoever. So guess what? That wasn't the place for me. And so sometimes professors like being, well, I'm at this research one institution. It may be better for your psyche that you're at Georgia State or Clark Atlanta. But sometimes it's this thing of trying to impress people you know, you got to be at my first job offer was at Clark Atlanta and I was going to take it, but I hadn't finished my dissertation yet, you know? And so, and, and I tell people these big white schools aren't for everybody. It is not for everybody. I know there's some, there's a push to want to work there, but no, you got to go what, where it feels right in your spirit. I tell people, if I leave Texas, I'm going two places, either Mississippi or Louisiana. Because I feel home at those places and I feel like my style works best in the deep South. And I think it's important to add that, that that question applies to people working outside of higher ed. Mm -hmm. Like if you're thinking about your corporate job yeah. and you know you going to Oregon to work at Nike right. and you know you're not gonna have a community there, right. Right. that may not be the best place mm -hmm. for you to go. Let me say this, I don't like, the, there are some terms I just don't like. Can I say that? I don't like the term anti-racist because you're assuming they all are. I don't like the term white privilege, even though the white folks have privilege, yes, but when, you, when, you, when they hear white privilege, what they hear you saying is that they didn't work hard. I mean, man, I, there's some phrases I just don't like to use. Don't like to use. So the question is about how white churches can do what? Be more, what's the question, Cruz? I don't know, and I, I to, I've told a couple of white pastors, that may not be the church you need to pastor. It may not be, you got them racist deacons, it may not be the place where you, where you have to pastor. One of the frustrating things about being a Christian is seeing how the white evangelical church has distorted the teachings of Jesus. And Dr. Jeremiah Wright said something a long time ago. He said, in America, we read the Bible from the viewpoint of the oppressor when it was written to be read from the viewpoint of the oppressed. You know, Egyptian oppression, Assyrian oppression, Babylonian oppression, Greco-Roman oppression in the New Testament, right? And we have allowed the white evangelical church to distort the teachings. And as a result, for those of us who are believers, our kids don't want to have nothing to do with the gospel. And I love Tony Evans to death but he is sold out for access. He is typically the only African-American pastor in some of those circles, but he will not speak truth to power. 
All right. Is that a mic drop or what? That was, that was, that was, that was. <laughs> Yeah, I think the George Floyd window is closing quickly. Um, I think you got thing, you got oh, you got AI, or oh, uh, you know, you got you got globalization, you got automa automation, you got artificial intelligence. The economy is shrinking, jobs are never coming back. And so I think what black folk gotta prepare themselves for is that, you know, how do we prepare for jobs in this new, I call it the PPE, the post-pandemic economy? You know, one of the things I'm most excited, we've taken 400 black and brown kids abroad since 2013 to China, South Africa. We're taking about 80 students to Dubai over spring break. And my rationale is we've got to prepare our children. We've got to let them know that, that their job market is bigger than the U.S. You know, you can be you can take that nonstop flight on, out of Emirates, out of Houston and be in Dubai in 14 hours. So we're just trying to shrink the world for them, letting them know that you can get a job anywhere in the world. And some of their job offers may be may be places abroad. You know, and so that's what we do. And, you know, and it's fun taking these kids abroad. Can I tell one quick story about taking kids abroad? Okay, so we, the first time we took kids to China, 2013, and, 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 and there's one of our students. She's a, she was a counting major at UT. Her name is Lashanika Ephraim, all right? Now, when I said the name Lashanika, a certain image went in your head, that's her, all right? <laughs> She's straight South Dallas, gonna have purple hair, nails, all that, all right? So, we, so we're in Beijing for about 30, 32, 33 days. And one weekend we go to this rural village uh, at the base of the Great Wall of China, all right? And so we're out there Friday night and then we wake up Saturday morning at three in the morning and we do a three hour hike up this hill. Now this is not touristy, this is through, it's, you know, it, it's real narrow. And, and the person who's leading us is this, remember that guy Jocelyn, this 80 year old Chinese dude smoking cigarettes the whole time. And it's all uphill. He ain't huffing and puffing or nothing, all right? So the goal of it is to get to the, get to the Great Wall of China about 15 minutes before the sun comes up. And I remember hearing La Shanika say, sitting on the Great Wall of China, she said, who would have thought a girl like me from South Dallas? Now she had her hair wrapped and all that, right? Who would have thought a girl like me from South Dallas would be sitting on the Great Wall of China watching the sun come up? And, and so for me, taking these kids abroad, well, Dr. Moore, what are we gonna do in Dubai? Don't worry about it, just get your ticket, you're gonna go with us. It's about exposing them. And the funny thing is when we take kids abroad, here's the thing, the kids who have the biggest trouble adapting are these rich white kids. Because we go to China, we play Amazing Race, we get them lost on the first day of China in a city of 30 million people. Like, Dr. Moore, what if we get lost? You black, you will never be lost in Beijing, right? They'd be like, you, you seen the black girl? Yeah, she, she went that way on Wednesday, all right? <laughs> but it is often the white kids who, need, who, who want you to stay with them. Because the black and Mexican kids, they've had to adjust to different environments their entire life. And so what we tell those kids is that what you thought in many ways, right? Those ankle weights you were born with, when you take the ankle weights off, you can just go, you, you in shape and you can just go sore, all right? So that's why we take these kids abroad so they can be prepared for the new economy. Mm-hmm. One of the things I was excited about me and a friend did at LSU, so we were there during Katrina and after Katrina, I said, man, we gotta do something with, with these boys. That's just my passion, these boys, this middle school. And so at the time, Prescott Middle School was the worst middle school <laughs> Somebody said the worst middle school in America post Katrina, all right? Because a lot of New Orleans kids came into Baton Rouge. So we go meet with the principal and I asked LSU, I said, hey, we're gonna start this Saturday school for boys. You know, can y'all give me some money? They said, no, we'll have no money to give you, but whatever building you wanna use, we'll open it up for you on Saturdays. I'm like, I got AC, I got technology, we're good, all right? So we go to Prescott Middle School and I, me and my boys sit down and talk to the principal. And I said, we wanna start a program with the 50 of your worst boys, all right? And she said, and I said, well, maybe we can come back in a couple of weeks and, you know, we can set up a meeting. She said, no, Professor Moore, I'll call those young men down right now. It's the inner city middle school. The sister principal get on the PA, she just start calling the names. And you just hear the brothers, you, you know how they do, right? And so brothers in, brothers in, the, in, the, in the cafeteria say, hey, man, we're going to start the Saturday school. 
next Saturday, we're going to have a bus here at like 7.30 in the morning. I told my boy, I said, hey, man, go get a 55 coach passenger bus. And we want to make this special for the kids. So the first day, my boy goes to the school at 7.30 to meet the students. I go to LSU, get everything set up. And I'm like, man, I was hoping for like 10 students. And I was calling my boy. He wasn't answering. And, um, and he texted me. He said, man, he said, man, we got 40 students. I'm excited. So I meet the bus at LSU. And, you know, the problem with middle school kids, we got like three and four-year-olds getting off the bus. And I said, hey, man, where did three and four-year-olds come from? He said, well, ask him. And I said, hey, man, you know, who, who are these people? And he said, my mama said, if I'm going to go, I got to bring them with me. All right? We did that program for about nine to 10 months. And one morning we got a call. The police officer said that some, a couple of our kids were in the back of a police car, went to pick them up. And I said, officer, what happened? He said, well, they broke into school. I said, officer, there is nothing in there to steal. And I said, what did y'all do? He said, Mr. Moore, we are trying to get our backpacks. And these are kids one or two grades behind. We took them to Houston for a weekend. You would have thought we were going to Paris. And one mom came with some balloons. I'm like, mom, we just going to Houston. She said, baby, I know, but my son ain't been nowhere before. So we stay at my friend's church in Houston. And my thing is, <laughs> they moving the pulpit furniture around, shooting dice in the church. But you know what? We're going to be all right. And it was such an amazing experience for us. And I think if more Black professionals just did the simple stuff like that, no grant money was did out of our pocket. It was just very, very impactful. And it was probably the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my professional life. Uh, for me personally, this kind of goes back to our conversation earlier mm -hmm. about what we see older folk doing mm -hmm. in the places that like I'll be in in the next 20 years. And I, I don't know. Let me tell you what the issue uh, is. If you go to any black church, I'm sure most black churches are having worship, worship wars, particularly traditional black churches, right? Uh, young people just want a straight praise team, older folk want more traditional choir and all that kind of, you know what the issue is? Is that sometimes the older folk feel like we don't respect the sacrifices that they made. And we gotta own that. We make it seem like we're brand new, we're the first one to do it. And these older folk like, Negro, I've been paying tithes this church for 50 years. And so they feel as if in many ways we don't acknowledge them or don't appreciate what they've done. So as a younger generation, you got to do that. Can you do that? I'm I'm, I'm going to wrestle with that. <laughs> uh, I watched the last special. I think Dave Chappelle has run out of material. Uh, I think the, the transgender jokes, hey, they're not even funny. Uh, but it seemed like, you know, when you harp on that for 40, 45 minutes, I think you got some issues going on within yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know, man. I think, I think I lost, I don't know if I lost respect for this. It just wasn't funny to me. You know what I'm saying? And it, 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 it seemed like lazy comedy, you know, but um, uh, so, that, you know, that's just my take, you know, so I don't know, man. I, I guess I don't know if they want that answer, but it just wasn't, just didn't do anything for me, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. I want to thank you, Dr. Moore, mm -hmm. for being here. Uh, when I close these conversations, I always end with this question because Entrepreneurial Appetite is, is a book club. We host book discussions. And I, I want to ask you, what are you reading right now? And what do you suggest for us to be reading? Well... I actually been reading some books on marriage. Me and my wife have been married 20 years, but you know what I realized? She's a different person now and I'm a different person. <laughs> What's that? You know, I mean, it's real. It's a Tony Dungy book actually, but, but more in the realm of politics or, or history. Uh, I'm really fascinated by the Jim Crow period. My mm. mom had a, uh, last story and I'm done. My mom had a cousin who was lynched in Louisiana in 1935. And if you go on your phone right now, and if you type in Negro lynched in the Louisiana jail, the New York Times article will pop up. And the reason why this lynching is so interesting, it was the first one of 1935 in rural Louisiana, you know, uh, very, very wealthy African-American family. But it was, you know, it was in many ways it was national news. But the reason why it's, it sticks with me 
because this was my grandfather. It was a close cousin of my grandfather. We would go down to Louisiana every Christmas and for July 4th. I noticed one thing about my grandfather and his two brothers. They couldn't keep a job. They were always drunk. And it seemed like, I didn't know, it seemed like life had been just taken out of them. And then when I came across this lynching in 1935, it explained it. That if that's your cousin you got baptized with, you went to school with, you went to church with, and he gets lynched in the jail and they take him out of the jail and they dump his body in front of, you know, in front of his parents' house, right around the corner from my grandmother's house. That will take the life out of you. And you know, my grandmother never voted. She died in 2001. And she would say voting is for white folks. And she died at like 90 or 91. And so, man, the Jim Crow period is just really interesting to me because I don't think we talk about it nearly enough. You know, so that's what I'm, this book called Dark, called Dark Journey, Black Mississippians in the Age of Jim Crow. So that's what I'm reading right now. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah.